a real honour and pleasure to have Bob Whitaker with us. Bob is an award-winning journalist and author, has written much uh, good work for the Boston Globe, and more recently books, um, um, Mad in America and The Anatomy of an Epidemic. And he's here to talk to us about medical investigative journalism, why it matters. Bob. I think we set this up wrong. Hold on just a second. It's actually not a slideshow I want. Hold on, sorry. Okay, good. Uh, sorry. Yeah, first of all, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. I just it, I want to thank the BMJ and thank the Open Society Foundation, so it's great being here. Uh, real quickly, uh, I'll tell you maybe how I came to be here. Um, so I was a medical reporter at the Albany Times Union for a number of years. And then in 1994, I actually left daily journalism, and I co-founded a publishing company called Center Watch that focused on the business of clinical trials. You know, the, the contract research organization was growing, that sort of thing. And while we were doing that uh, uh, publication, it became evident to me that we think of clinical trials as a scientific enterprise meant to flesh out whether the drugs are safe and effective. And in so many ways, they're actually a marketing enterprise. The, co the companies design their trials in ways to create a story that may will make that product successful in the marketplace. And then in 1998, I went to the Boston Globe to propose a series on abuses of patients in psychiatric research settings. And one of the things we were looking about was in the trials of the new atypical antipsychotics in which they were said to be so safe and effective. There actually were a lot of deaths in those trials that went unreported, that sort of thing. Um, but at this time, my understanding of a psychiatry was within a very familiar narrative, which was that we were making great progress in understanding the biology of these disorders. We had drugs that fixed those problems, those chemical imbalances, like insulin for diabetes, so this was a story of progress. And one of the things we even did in that series in the Boston Globe, we looked at studies in which they had withdrawn antipsychotic medications from schizophrenia patients, and we said, that's unethical. You would never withdraw um, insulin from a diabetic, so why would you do it with this group of patients? And you know, I was rewarded for that, uh, that series. That was a series that uh, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, et cetera. But then after it was published, I began to question what we had written, actually. And the reason was this. I came upon two studies that really began to challenge that narrative of progress. One was a, a study done by Harvard researchers who reported in 1994 that outcomes for schizophrenia patients today, longer term outcomes, were no better than they had been in the first third of the 20th century. So that belies this story of progress. And then even more important was this. The World Health Organization had twice done studies that compared outcomes in three poor countries. India, uh, Nigeria, and Colombia with outcomes in the U.S. and I found that outcomes were much better in the future. You won't have a good outcome if you're diagnosed with schizophrenia. And then I looked at those studies and they investigated and they, after the first one, what the researchers hypothesized was that maybe the reason for the better outcomes in the poor countries was that the patients were more medication compliant. They took their antipsychotics more regularly. It's so obviously a very valid hypothesis. If the medications are supposed to be so essential, then compliance should be associated with better outcomes. But then when they looked at medication usage in the second study, they found that, in fact, the drugs were being used very differently in the poor countries. They were being used acutely, but not chronically. Only about 16% of patients in the poor countries were maintained on the medications regularly. Now, you can see right there, there's a, that belies what we know to be true. You have to be on these drugs for, for your life if you have this diagnosis, and we have policy organized around that belief. So at this point, I begin to ask this question. We have a narrative in psychiatry about this narrative of progress. Does science support that narrative? If we dig into the scientific literature, are we going to find a consistency? And if not, this, begins, this brings us to the question of this conference, is why is there this gap? In other words, has journalism failed us? In fact, have the medical journals failed us? So the books I wrote on this subject, uh, Madden America, and then Anatomy of an Epidemic, really looked at this very question. 
is our belief system, is the narrative of which we've organized our care around, is it consistent with science? And that's what I'll try to do real quickly here. Now, in 1980, the, uh, the American Psychiatric Association published the third edition of its Diagnostic, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and this was a book that made for a very big change in American society. In fact, the past president of the American Psychiatric Association, Jeffrey Lieberman, has called it the most important book published in the last 50 years, not just in psychiatry, but in American society, and in many ways, I agree with him. Because what happened before this time we had many psychological conceptions about what Freudian conceptions about what caused psychiatric distress. With 1980, the American Psychiatric Association adopted a disease model. It says these problems, depression, anxiety, ADHD, et cetera, are diseases of the brain. And once you have that conception, of course, you're going to very much open up the use of drugs to, as first-line therapy to treat those diseases of the brain. Now, there was no scientific discovery for this switch. It was basically, you can find the political reasons behind it, the guild reasons behind it, but there were no scientific discoveries about the biology of these disorders that caused this switch. But after, and after the APA publishes this manual, it now sets up basically a public relations uh, effort to train psychiatrists what to say, to beef up its own sort of public relations um, initiatives. It began holding annual conferences in which it would tell, um, it would bring in um, reporters and stuff, and they would talk, reporters and basically journalists from the media, TV, et cetera, and tell of these advances in, in, in discovering the biology of mental disorders. And the big one was this, in essence, that we have discovered that chemical imbalances are the causes of mental disorders. And the one you've heard most frequently is that low serotonin is the cause of depression. And you can begin, you can see here, 1981, we start to see reports from, um, you know, respected academic psychiatrists saying, well, it looks like we've found the cause of depression. And I just went through this, and you'll just see a president interview with the St. Petersburg Times. Here's the APA president, Richard Harding, saying that uh, we now know that mental illnesses such as depression or schizophrenia are not moral weaknesses or imagined but real diseases, but caused by abnormalities of brain structure and imbalances of chemicals in the brain. In 2005, you can see the APA, that's American Psychiatric Association, puts out a brochure that's talk facts about depression. Antidepressants may be used to correct imbalances in the level of chemicals in the brain. And you can see that research has shown, this is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. So this becomes part of the narrative. It becomes a key part of the narrative that governs our care. And what is this telling us? It is telling us a story of great advances. I mean, think about like insulin for diabetes. There are a few things more important than when you discover the pathology of a major disorder and then you have an antidote. That is a metaphor for a great advance. And that is the metaphor that is being told to us, that this incredibly complex human brain, we found a cause of depression, and now we can correct it. Then the next question is, you go into the scientific literature, did we indeed find that to be true? And when you look at the chemical imbalance theory of, uh, theory of depression and others, you find that it arose not from an understanding of what was happening in people so diagnosed, but from an understanding of how the drugs acted on the brain. So you take an antidepressant, and this actually goes back to the 60s and all, an antidepressant will up serotonergic activity in the brain. We could talk about how that's done. So they hypothesized that depression is due to low serotonin. In other words, the hypothesis is based on the mechanism of action of the drug. Same thing with the antipsychotics. But now they have to do tests to see if people with depression, before going on an antidepressant, do they have low serotonin? And that theory actually began to fall apart in the 1970s. You'll see here in the 1984, the NIMH did a big study to put this under a microscope, and they said, we're not finding that prior to going on antidepressants that people have a dis with depression have a disturbed serotonergic system. Anyway, Prozac comes to market in 1988. And now we really hear through uh, direct-to-consumer advertising about the, how Prozac may correct the low serotonin in the brain, et cetera. It becomes a very common belief. But, and there's a lot more research that goes on, but continually they fail to find that there's a lesion or an abnormality in the serotonergic system in depressed patients. Now, and believe it or not, in 1998, if you look in the American Psychiatric Association medical textbook, they said, you know, we have not found this. And in fact, the whole idea is pretty flawed from the beginning because there's really no reason that the cause of a disorder should be the opposite of the, action of the mechanism of action of a drug. 
Stephen Stahl, this is a, a textbook used in psychiatry, says there is no clear and convincing evidence that a monoamine, serotonin is a monoamine, deficiency accounts for depression. That is, there is no real monoamine deficit. And then Kenneth Kendler, who was one of the leaders in this search for chemical imbalances in the brain, co-editor-in-chief of psychological medicine in 2005, he published an article summing up this long search for chemical imbalances in the brain, and he says, we have hunted for big, simple neurochemical explanations for psychiatric disorders and have not found them. Now, here's my favorite quote of all. So recently, I mean, after Kenneth Kendler writes this, the chemical imbalance theory was seen as discredited within research circles. It was seen as a failed hypothesis, didn't find it. A lot of people have been writing about this, finally. And then Ronald Pies, who's uh, former editor-in-chief of Psychiatric Times, now trying to defend why psychiatry ever said this. He's actually saying now psychiatry never said that, but that's not so. But he says this, in truth, the chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. And in a way, that's true, because if you look in their own literature, they're saying we're not finding it. So if you're well-informed, you know it's really not playing out. The problem, of course, is the public wasn't being informed that. And so we have this extraordinary gap where we have 80, a survey in 2006 found that you know, the majority, the 80 to 87% of Americans now know that chemical imbalances cause mental disorders. Now, as a metaphor, of course, if you have depression, um, one, you're being told you need to take this medication, and two, you probably should take it for life if it's like insulin for diabetes. And you can see now, just in this little story, how the practice of prescribing and, um, psychiatric medications has been based on a metaphor as, that serves uh, financial interests, certainly of the, of the drug companies, it also serves the interests of a guild, the American Psychiatric Association, because it's a story that tells they are making great progress, increases their power in society, but it's a false story. So going forward second, now let's just look at the second thing that happens post-1980 is we're going to start hearing again and again about great progress in bringing new drugs to market. Now, in 1980, one of the new disorders created for the first time in, D in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, was panic disorder. And now, since it's identified as a discrete disorder, a company can try to get a drug approved for the treatment of that. So Upjohn has a benzodiazepine, a Xanax, that's come to market, and now they're going to test it for panic disorder. And this is the slide showing that was used to report that this drug was effective for this new disorder. And by the way, this is, this is the mid-80s when this is done. Even though Upjohn was paying for the trials, in this case, they really handed over control of the trial to anxiety experts at the APA. This is not a an, uh, drug company controlled trial. So this is what they report. This is what the conclusion in the literature, in the medical literature. This study provides a demonstration of the efficacy of alprazolam, that's Xanax. And you can see the graphic. That's indeed what it showed, right? Okay. Oh, by the way, Clareman is a past president of the NIMH. Here's what the press reported. In a panic, help is on the way. This works for 70% to 90% of those who suffer from the illness. Makes sense they would report this. That's what the graphic shows. The unfortunate part is that wasn't the study. I mean, that wasn't the actual study results. The study had two endpoints, not four weeks. It had an endpoint at eight weeks, and it had an endpoint at 14 weeks. Eight weeks was the end of the short-term efficacy trial, not four weeks. And then because benzodiazepines are known to be um, addictive, they needed to have a part of the trial where they would withdraw uh, from the benzodiazepine because that was a recommended. You're not supposed to take benzodiazepines long term, so they needed to have a second part in which the drug would with be withdrawn. You'll see at the first endpoint, week eight, there is no statistically significant difference between the two arms, placebo and drug. And then you will see that when they were withdrawn following um, uh, those put on drug, that they became seriously worse, those who had been exposed to drug, such that by the end of this time, you'll see that the drug exposed group is doing much, much worse. They're actually worse than they were at baseline, and many, in fact, could not get off the drug. So what this study, if you really look at this, by the way, this is the data, if you, it's not in the abstract, 
But all I did here was go to a table that reported the number of panic attacks week by week, and then I constructed this graphic, okay? The data is reported. It's just not highlighted or discussed in this way. So what happens? It's the first uh, graphic that, of course, governs the use of this drug. Uh, very soon it became the fifth most prescribed medication in the United States. It's still regularly prescribed. And both in the UK and the US, you can now find all sorts of people who are addicted to benzodiazepines cannot get off. And that, of course, is an end that is predicted by that, that study itself. But it was suppressed and it wasn't publicized. So now let's go forward to the SSRIs, this next group of drugs, of course, Prozac. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember this. I certainly, unfortunately, am. Uh, Prozac comes to market in 1988, and it is heralded as this extraordinary new drug. It makes people feel better than well. You can see Newsweek, uh, a breakthrough drug for depression. Here's just, I just pulled some quotes from what major media outlets were saying about this. Nearly everyone has something nice to say about the new treatment. Patients are exclaiming it never felt better. New York Times says antidepressants work by restoring the balance of neurotransmitter activity in the brain. This is that chemical imbalance story. I love this quote. One expert tells the Times, um, Prozac is not like alcohol or Valium. It's like antibiotics. Most doctors believe that chronic depression is like, she's naming a patient there, is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. To correct it, the doctor prescribed Prozac. Now, at the same time when Prozac comes to market, the NIMH conducts a, what's called a DART campaign. It was a campaign to convince Americans they needed to rethink what they knew about depression. In 1986, they had done a, um, a survey, and most Americans thought depression eventually would pass on its own and was so often rooted in, culture, in contextual problems. And they said, no, it's a disease of the brain. That's number one. And two, you can see it, there's this huge difference in recovery rates. By the way, I have no idea where this difference comes from. You cannot find any scientific foundation for that recovery rates of 70 80% versus 20 to 40% for a placebo. It gets repeated in the, in the media. I love this. If a second round of treatment is required, the cure rate jumps to 90%. But what did the science actually show? The key thing here is really this one. So there were these five studies. You pull the results, and there's basically no difference between Prozac and placebo. It's one point on what's called the Hamilton scale. It's a clinically meaningless difference. And by the way, Prozac was never actually tested alone as a trust, uh, treatment for depression. In the trials early on, they noticed that many people were becoming agitated on Prozac, so they allowed those given the drug to be prescribed benzodiazepines. So the studies actually were a test of Prozac plus benzodiazepines. And as one expert later said in a, in a trial, it made the trial scientifically worthless. But you can see the huge difference. Then in Germany, uh, they ran a, a major trial. The German regulators looked at the data and they found two things. One, a lack of efficacy, and two, a lot of danger in the sense that people were becoming manic. So it was actually initially rejected, and as they said, it was totally unsuitable for the treatment of depression. I'll go back here, one thing here, though. You see this? People are getting better, okay? I mean, it's not that pros, people aren't getting better on, on Prozac over short term. It's just that they're not getting any better than on placebo, sort of the natural recovery rate, okay? Anyway, so you can see that, again, we had the story about antidepressants that were sort of curative, fixed the chemical imbalance in the brain, so very effective. And what is science telling us? They're actually not very effective. Uh, there have been some further analysis. The group that they seem really effective for is those who are very severely ill. But mild to moderate, you just don't beat placebo. But yet, where are we at today in terms of use? We have about one in, this just came out from JAMA, about one, of, that is, one in eight Americans now taking antidepressants. Going forward, the next we have the atypical antipsychotics. Risperdal comes to market in 1994. This was what appeared in the medical literature. Risperidone has important advantages compared with Haldol. That's the old existing one. More effective on all, on all domains. And then in the media, the story was this. We know those old drugs cause all sorts of bad side effects, Parkinsonian symptoms, tardive dyskinesia, et cetera. These new drugs don't cause these side effects, okay? You can see this. Uh, this is the New York Times. No major side effects had appeared in the trials. We also hear the drug was thought to relieve schizophrenia symptoms by blocking excessive flows. This is, this fixes a chemical imbalance not of just one neurotransmitter, but multi-transmitters, and now we have a new uh, hope for people with schizophrenia. Again, Washington Post does not cause sedation, blah, blah, blah. Here's the FDA's view of Risperdal, and I got this through a Freedom of Information request. Uh, 
They said, you cannot make any claim to Janssen that your drug is any safer or more effective than the old drugs. Now, why did they say this? Because the trials are biased by design. What they did is they used a very high dose of Haldol to cause a lot of side effects. They tested that against three doses of Risperdal. And then if you look at the low dose, surely there is a, a great difference. Now, after this happened, by the way, they tested Risperdal against Haldol, same doses, and actually Risperdal had a little bit higher rate of side effects than the old problematic Haldol. But of course, this is not the story that becomes uh, well known. And we get, Ris we get uh, Ris Risperdal, we get Zyprexa, we get all these atypical antipsychotics. And because the message is that these have very little side effects, we now begin to use them off-label for all sorts of other, of other things in kids. Whereas the old drugs, we knew antipsychotics had to be used uh, sparingly. And in 2009, this class of drugs became the top revenue generating class of drugs in America. Now going forward, and I'll try to finish this up pretty quickly. Uh, we have the idea that it is the uh, studies funded by drug companies that are the problematic trials and that if they're funded by the uh, governments, we're going to get nice, clean, well-run studies. The NIMH is star D trial. This is the most... Um, uh, the largest antidepressant trial ever conducted. When the NIMH mounted this in the late 90s, early 2000s, they said this. This is going to be the trial that governs our care of depression. And what they said was this. If you look at industry-funded antidepressant trials because of exclusion criteria, there's only a small percentage of patients you've seen in clinical care that would qualify for those studies. So this is going to be the... the the patients we just see in clinical care, it's not going to be placebo controlled. We're just going to see if some use of these drugs, how can we use them and how effective they are. And it had this design. You'd come in, you'd get, one, you'd get a drug. If you didn't um, remit or get better on that first drug, you'd give a second chance of some sort of care, drug plus psychotherapy, and you'd get four chances of care before you were seen as either remitted or failed. And the message was, maybe the drugs don't always work the first time. But if you just keep trying, we're going to cure people. And you can see it, NIMH, communal remission weight was 67%, almost 70%. And New Yorker, we all know that New Yorker does a great job at fact-checking, right? So what do they say? There was a 67% effectiveness rate for antidepressant medication, far better than the rate achieved by a placebo. Now, there was no placebo in this case, but I guess I'm just saying what is the normal rate. And I was, I, was in a, I was in my uh, locker room a while back when this came out, and I heard one doctor say to the other, we finally have the evidence that this care really works. The problem was, you probably can't see this, it's nothing like that actually. And the way we now know this is, by this I mean this, a, a man named Ed Piggott used a Freedom of Information Quest to get the protocol. And once he got the protocol, he could see all, all the way they deviated from the protocol. so hard to figure it out. Anyway, what do they do? They start... They start making changes so they can reduce the number of people they're going to count as treatment failures. And then they make changes that they can add a number of patients to be seen as remitters. Now, a couple of uh, amazing things is, for example, they had a number of patients who, in fact, weren't even depressed enough to be eligible for the trial. And you had to have a Hamilton score of 14, which is not very depressed. Some of them didn't have that, but they kept them in the study. And now they begin, began... Um, counting them as among the remitted patients. There were other patients they didn't even have a baseline score for, but then like maybe at a later thing they would be shown as remitted, they would count them as remission. Then they switched outcome measures. You were supposed to use HAMD. They switched to QUIDS RSRD. So, and then finally, the whole thing about 67% was, well, if everyone had main, maintained in the trial, stayed in the trial and remitted at the rate that those who did, we'd end up with 67%. So actually, if you go to the protocol, only 38% of those who entered the trial actually remitted. And it's not as actually if they were cured, you could still have a low level of symptoms and be called remitted. Real quickly here, so what I went and did, and I just looked at the, the ties of the investigators. Yes, it was funded by the NIMH, but every investigator, the investigators were heavily, you know, they worked as speakers, advisors, et cetera. So the financial tie was still there. The guild influence is still there, of course, right? Because this is one of psychiatry's products. They can hardly say, um, you know, it wasn't working for the majority of people. Now, real final, and I'll, I can finish this up. The other thing that is quite remarkable is you will find that when they have done long-term studies um, that did not find what the guild wanted to find,
those studies never get publicized, and in fact, often they have trouble even getting published. This is a study done by Martin Harrell, funded by the NIMH. It's the best long-term study we have of schizophrenia outcomes. Now, when he started this study, it's going to be a naturalistic study. Everybody gets treated with drugs in the hospital, they're discharged, and now he's just going to follow them for two, four and a half, seven and a half, ten, fifteen years. If you look at his, his hypothesis, he's going to say, those who go off their medications are going to do terribly. And we're now going to have documentation, in essence, about why you need to be on these medications long term. He found exactly the opposite. He found, in fact, this is, and by the way, this is a large study. He started with 200 patients, and he had 145 still in the study 15 years later. That is a really good uh, inclusion rate. In other words, you're not losing many. Of the schizophrenia patients, at the end of two years, um, he had about 40% uh, of their patients had quit their drugs at this time. And the recovery rate's a little better after two years, but between years two and four and a half, those off medication continued to get better such that the recovery rate was eight times higher. And to be in recovery, you had to be asymptomatic, working, have a fairly decent social life. Again, it's about an eight-fold recovery rate. He's now published his 20-year data. The unmedicated patients uh, do better on every domain of functioning, cognitive function, anxiety, uh, much less likely to be psych uh, psychotic years out. Now, I'm not saying this is conclusive of anything, but I think you need to have this information as part of, of what our knowledge is about long-term use of antipsychotic medications. He could not get this published in the United States. He did get it published in an American journal. He was, I mean, in a British journal. He was told by his colleagues, do not publish, this is bad for psychiatry. But he does not have ties to this pharmaceutical industry. My point is here, this, this, this result has never appeared in any American newspaper. Why not? Imagine if it were the opposite. Imagine if the people who were medicated long-term had eight times the recovery rate. Would we be hearing about that? We would. But it is just not known. It's starting to become known, frankly, because I made such a big deal about it. Here's what he concluded. You will never hear this in any sort of the common narrative. This is what he said. I conclude that patients off medication. And in terms of how our society is organized, because we believe so strongly that these medications are helpful, uh, we have a lot of laws now insisting that people, when they relieve the, the um, hospital, have to take the medication. But if this information, and believe it or not, this, there's a lot of other studies that are uh, reflecting this difference in outcomes. I want to go back to the STAR-D study. Remember, this was also bet to show that people would stay well long term. Now, this data is in the, one of the publications, but you can't make sense of that graphic at all. It really was finally this Ed Piggott uh, who managed to really flesh it out. And look at this. Out of 4,041 patients who entered the trial, only 108 were still well and in the trial at into one year. This is the worst result, long-term result, I've ever seen of any antidepressant trial. Never known. There's been 100, 100 publications of STAR-D, and they have never discussed or put this result in an abstract, okay? And I, I will say, of course, it's a failure of journalism, but in a way, it's a failure of, me of medical journals not to highlight this information as well. How about long-term outcomes of a Ritalin for ADHD? 1994, the NIMH starts a study called the MTA study, and they say, up to now, we have no evidence that stimulants provide a long-term benefit for kids diagnosed with ADHD. We have no such evidence. This is the first good clinical trial of uh, a drug for kids. And these results are going to be uh, disseminated widely. Won't go into design, but after 14 months, yes, the medicated kids were doing a little better. They had a greater reduction of ADHD symptoms, and we're doing a little bit of reading. And now if you go on the web, your parent, your kid gets diagnosed with uh, ADHD, they'll tell you the 14-month results. But that study continued. Just read the three-year results, read the six-year results, and ask if in our narrative of medicating kids for ADHD, this information is part of that narrative. Just give you a second to read it. You can see it's not. It's not in the abstract either. It is in the, it is in the studies. If you read them carefully, you find this. And again, my, my appeal here, if we're talking about importance of medical journalism, is you need to have this information for a society to organize its care. And what you can see very quickly in this 25 minutes is we have been told a narrative around how effective drugs are, that they, they fix a chemical imbalance, they're certainly thought to be helpful for you long term. And what you really find in the science is a very different story. We don't know the biology, 
The drug's efficacy is sometimes very questionable, and there's all sorts of long-term <coughs> questions. To, there's all sorts of reasons to question their long-term use. This is a social injury, I think, is that A, we've organized ourselves around a false narrative. Two, this whole practice, because this knowledge is not known, uh, belies informed consent standards. And here's the other thing is, with this paradigm of care, you're seeing the burden of mental illness as measured by the pe number of people uh, going on disability has soared. And by the way, it has soared in every country that makes great use of SSRIs and, and other drugs for affective disorders. I was going to just show, you know, why it can be so difficult. The, and I need to stop so we can have a Q&A. The reason it can be so difficult, of course, is first of all, <clears throat> uh, you know, you really have to read the studies really closely because it's not going to be in the abstract. Then if the, if the results aren't what the guild wants, the data may be presented but very in a very obscure manner. Uh, sometimes you have to use freedom of information quests. And here's what it really gets hard. The people who are publishing these studies and writing them have great prestige in our society, right? They're academic psychiatrists at medical centers. That is a place of that we really honor those people. And now you're questioning their own presentation of data. It gets really difficult. And if you try to do this as yourself, which I've done, you know, as writing books, what's going to happen to you? Because you have no sort of um, larger organization supporting you. You're going to get attacked. Uh, I was likened to an AIDS denier when uh, it came out and likened to a South African dictator um, who by virtue of denying AIDS had caused hundreds of thousands of people to die. Uh, I was invited to give a grand rounds uh, talk at Massachusetts General Hospital, but really what the point was, the, the powers that be wanted to embarrass me and next thing you know, I'm sitting there, they say this book contains blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, it, and then the, the, the psychiatrist next to me says, yeah, black box warning. And you can read it. <laughs> Um, there was an intelligence group that began following me uh, even before the book came out. The reason I know this, VFluence is a group that was founded by a public relations person that had worked for uh, people running for office and what his deal was to sort of uh, attack the credibility, do campaigns to show that the opponent was, you know, a bad person. Um, anyway, someone managed to get into their uh, files, put Whitaker's name in and they had a file on me and this is just one screenshot. Um, you can, you can talk about where I was called an AIDS denier, but here's what amazed me. They were reporting on me for the pharmaceutical companies before I even did finish the book. They knew I'd been at the Psychiatric Association meeting. And you can see continuing monitoring activities. Uh, there have been, this is as a, uh, by the way, I think this first, um, uh, this review happened on the day the book was published. It was by a doctor who'd never written before, for the Globe before. I'm pretty sure this was a planted review, never written since, okay. Um, there was another group that is very much a, uh, in, in favor of uh, forced drug medication. They lobby Congress, et cetera. Now, I was sent some, um, I got some uh, documents of theirs where they had internally said we have to stop Whitaker from speaking, and they would actually ha sometimes contact lawyers when I was asked to speak, saying it's a misuse of funds if you're using public funds. And then they knew I was going to speak at the National Alliance for Mentally Ill, and they said we need to take advantage of this opportunity. I speak at the National Alliance for Mentally Ill. And then one of this group that is very much before, uh, one person had been at my uh, talk, quit their antipsychotics, and then was now missing. So I now have blood on my hands. It was an anonymous. I'm pretty sure there was no such person. No one could ever say it was true. And finally, uh, this is my favorite one. Uh, this is by Jeffrey Lieberman, past president. And uh, this makes me quite proud. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob. Um, do please, we've got some time for questions. So while you're just deciding whether you'll come up to the microphone, um, I just have a, an opening question for you, Bob. So what makes a good investigative journalist? Uh, I mean, what, what, are the, what are the attributes that have uh, helped you to survive and uh, carry on? Well, you know, really for me, this really began with curiosity. I mean, I just came upon a, a fact, the World Health Organization studies that said, um, Listen, the people are doing better in poor countries, and being in a rich country is a strong predictor you won't do well. And I thought, well, why should that be? I mean, really, it was that. Uh, I think the curiosity is, is, is such a key thing. And then I think the thing is, um, when, when I first became a medical reporter, after being a regular reporter, I was sort of told, you're not going to be a regular reporter anymore. So, so when you're a reporter covering politics or business, you're supposed to be skeptical, right? And you know that people lie to you. Um, but with medicine, it's almost like you're told, okay, your job now as a reporter is to be a translator. 
These people know, and your job is to make things clear to the audience. That's your job. You're no longer supposed to be skeptical. And so I think what you have to understand is medicine's a business, and the people, the, the doctors and others, they're human beings too, and they may tell stories that are to their personal advantage. And so you need to bring those same skills to, to medicine as well. And do you get the sense that we're winning, or is this just an endless task where we're all kind of part of a big gravy train that, that we too are just sort of keeping ourselves going and can, can carry on forever? Is there going to be a, an end to this? <sighs> um, I have a yes and no answer to that. <laughs> In some ways, the narrative that has driven psychiatry for the, since 1980 is collapsing. The chemical imbalance story is collapsing. You recently had Tom Insel, the head of the NIMH, retire, I mean, move on to Google, saying that you know we've made no progress in the last 20 years. Uh, there's a lot of now new talk about the fact that the medications really aren't working long term. So in a way, the story is collapsing. We're winning, but they're just moving on to a new narrative <laughs> that I think will serve their interests. Um, so I think there is so much money behind this ego and all and prestige that comes to tell one narrative that you're going to get a narrative that's meant to serve those interests, and it's really hard to counter that. Questions from people in the room? Come, do come up at the microphone and just say who you are, thanks. <coughs> Hi, uh, Bonnie McLean. Uh, I just, it's not really a question. Sorry, it's Bonnie, where, where are you? Just say where you're from. Oh, uh, Data and Donuts. I publish uh, online media. Uh, the interesting thing, it's not necessarily a question, but I had gotten caught, I, I like to hear what you were saying because I write about Alzheimer's a lot um, and I, I use the phrase Alzheimer's disease, the brand, and I had had media access to an international Alzheimer's conference that was rescinded after review of some of the um, critical comments I made around the research surrounding perhaps a monotherapeutic cure. And, but the interesting thing is, and I want to encourage people that may be a little hesitant to challenge, not granted media access any longer, to this event, can I come to yours? Because it was the White House Conference on Aging. Open arms. They welcome doesn't mean you can't climb out a window. So. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I say one thing that was really interesting to me, too, is when I began challenging the narrative, I couldn't go back to newspapers and magazines and write anymore. Of this, because you were actually seen as since you were challenging the narrative they had put together, uh, they were really thinking you must be biased and that sort of thing. So actually, I was shut out, of, and I'd written for magazines before, um, from writing about this issue because they thought I must be biased. And of course, they couldn't know this sort of level of, you know, how wrong the, how the science just didn't support the narrative. So it's it's you do get shut out. It's really tough. Susan Scooty, Medical Daily. Um, what do you think the influence of online publications have had on this? Uh, I feel, um, as a, I feel the public's appetite for, you know, optimism bias, a new drug, this that is so strong. So no one wants to hear bad news at first. I think there is like the counter narrative can, you know, uh, get purchase. After, you know, some people have had bad reactions, blah, 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 you know, so then, like, you know, once it's an established thing, then, you know, eventually someone can attack it, but immediately after, you know, a study comes out or something comes out, there is no criticism of it. I mean, yeah, no, that's, that. no, really. Is that, that because of the speed of the media? Well, that's changed? because when a new drug comes out, there's a lot of work making to, to promote that drug and to get uh, patients who say, will say, well, I mean, there's an extraordinary selling machine that goes into place. I will say what I did after this, I was so frustrated by the media, is I, I created a webzine for this called Madden America. And one of the things we do is we have a, a news column up there um, that just does all the news reports you don't see it in, you know, from the journals that you don't see in the major media. And we now getting, and then we also have a, people, a bunch of people writing, psychiatrists, psychologists, people with lived experience, that really uh, are sort of criticizing that narrative and, and exploring other things. And we have, last month we had about 200,000 unique visitors, so it helps us a little bit about getting the counter narrative out there. Thanks, Carl. Yeah. Hi, Bob. Uh, Hi, Carl Hennigan, University of Oxford. I'm really interested in remarkable talk, but you have illustrated that you've had to learn a lot of skills in the last 10 or 12 years in the field of evidence-based medicine. So I think I'm, I'm interested in the people who do some of this from the other side about if you'd have started out again, 
thinking about all the skills you've learned, what would you say now you think, well, actually, I wish I could have known this or there'd been a bit of provision of this <coughs> at the front end? Or do you think it's been okay to just go on this journey because you've just said, I've read into this? But there are a lot no, of this is really learn. great. Um, I wish I actually, because uh, I was self-taught on this, uh, really would have become better versed in statistics, p-values, that sort of thing. And Because um, I was doing it a bit on a wing on a prayer. I mean, just going through it. I mean, I was director of publications at Harvard Medical School in the, in, from 92 to, 94 to 95, at the same time I was starting that. And this was when evidence-based medicine was all the rage. So I had, that gave me the sense is you have to be able to go through these things and that you're not going to find things necessarily in the abstract and you have to look at the data, look at the tables. So I was trained in that, but I wasn't nearly as skilled in really understanding the data presentation and, you know, and, and how things are being calculated. I could do much better at that if I had that skill. Thanks. Last question. This is a little self-serving because I'm a medical reporter, but so I, just just say who you are. Oh, sorry, I'm Liz Zabo with USA Today, um, and uh, I I find that um, a lot of medical reporters who cover this as a full-time beat are very active in groups like the Association of Healthcare Journalists, and which tries really hard to teach people about how to be skeptical in a productive way, not to throw it, the baby out with the bathwater, but to learn about p-values and skepticism, and so I. Maybe it's self-serving. I, I think there's been a lot of progress among people who are, who are dedicated medical reporters. The problem is um, a lot of medical reports are now coming out, are, are now being written by people who aren't necessarily full-time medical reporters. They're a GA, a general assignment. It, at my newspaper, we had a medical investigation done by sports reporters who weren't as skeptical as um, maybe they, they could have been. And I'm just curious to ask people, you know, how do we, you know, what, what do we do? I mean, I, I think HCJ does a good job of trying to teach people, but what do we do um, about this, this trend of medical reporting being reported by people who aren't familiar with this? And, and um, m maybe that worries me a, a little bit more because I am a medical reporter, but, you know, how, how, do we, how do we help people who aren't going to be doing this every day and who maybe don't see the need to go to a conference like this? Or... Yeah, you know, I mean, of course that's a good question because medicine is so complicated. You want people who are, you know, well-grounded in reading stuff. I have to say, I think, but medical journalists, uh, I'm not so... I think the, 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 the sort of storylines are dictated by what is said to be important by the journals. There's not enough just going through, which can be very easy, and finding out the stories that aren't being highlighted by the medical journals in the medical community as the good stories to tell. So there isn't, the medical journal's attention is being directed one place, and stories that really uh, don't fit this larger story of medical progress aren't usually so highlighted. And just give you an example, why did no one cover the, um, the Herald reports on the long-term outcomes of uh, schizophrenia patients? Never appeared in an American newspaper. Never has. And, and even after, and it's what's so interesting, even when they were books, uh, even when I have had talks that um, maybe have been covered, they never actually talk about this. They never don't believe that maybe it'll be misleading or harmful, that sort of thing. So, we do need skilled medical reporters, but I also think medical reporters get inducted into a tribe. And the tribe is really into a narrative often of, of progress, et cetera. And I think really what we need is, of, is people who are skeptical and also people who are not letting the agenda being set by the powers that be, including the journals. And, really, and with Google and all, you can set up a, you know, search things that'll give you all sorts of things that you can just go through, Google reports, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Bob, thank you very much. Indeed. You're welcome.